Right, we're talking hurling now. I'm delighted to say Park Mara is with us to talk about his new book. It's called All on the Line, A Memoir of Hurling and Commitment. How are you? Good, you yourself. Good. We just had Eric Donovan in and uh, we were referring to him as a former professional boxer and he was talking about his identity. That was a big thing for you in the book as well, that whole, I'm a hurler. And then all of a sudden one day, you're not a hurler anymore. That's heartbreaking to read and it's heartbreaking to kind of experience like now at this remove obviously from your perspective to revisit that for the book cannot have been any easy thing to do no yeah it was like a, a long therapy session all right but um yeah difficult to come to terms with like you know i wasn't expecting it um i hadn't planned it um do you know and then just to be all taken away from the space of a couple of days between you know from wherever i got my first scan of my neck to when i met the specialist you know so yeah, it, it took me a while to come... Well, it, I'm still coming to terms, to be honest with you, and uh, it's just finding that whole new routine. And as you said, you know, your identity, I might, I'm i known as a hurler around home, like in Tipperary, you know, so, um, like, that whole thing is taken away from you. And, you know, you're just trying to find your own routine again and what's to fill that void, you know, and, and, yeah. it's, and it's hard to fill it, like, because it's, it's a major part of your life. Well, it's like everyday training, really. Like, you know, yeah. it's, it's not just the pitch sessions, it's the eating and it's the, like, uh, what's everybody else doing? And it's the WhatsApp groups, it's the analysis and all that kind of stuff. Exactly, yeah. Like, and you know, it's the small things, like, as you said there, you know, I found myself for the first few weeks and months, you know, opening up the biscuits, the biscuits and things like that I used to never even look at, like, <laughs> and even though you could enjoy him, you know, even a Claire at home would be saying, go on, you enjoy him, like, but it, it, it doesn't feel right, you know. And There's then, guilt associated with you know, it. And then I kind of, I used to love training and I fell out of love with the gym for a few weeks because I didn't feel like, what am I going to the gym to do? Like, you know, I have no end goal. Yeah. Um, you know, so for a few weeks I found that tough, but um, then obviously I found it better to exercise for my own mental health and and well-being you know I found it brought me into a bit of routine as well you know so took a bit of juggling to get used to get used to my, my new life as they say Was there any point over the last couple of years where you thought about retirement where you thought that you know I need to start thinking about what life is like or had you decided you were going to leave that like had you kicked that can down the road as far as you could Yeah I never really thought about retirement to be honest with you um, you know I was planning on going back for another year and possibly two seasons with, with Tipperary I was feeling you know, very, very fit. There was no sense, oh, I'll give it one last shot. It was like, screw that. I'm, uh, you know, someone are going to have to, like, chisel me out of this team. Yeah, no, I, I, I honest with you, I, I, I said, no, I'm planning on going back next year and we'll take it from there, like, you know, and see how we get on. And um, obviously my, the long term would have been to give the club a good three or four or five years when I'm able to give them a, you know, a decent three or four or five years, you know. And uh, so, yeah, like, whatever would have been taken away from the Tipperary scene, you know, taking out of the club scene as well was that that kind of you know hit very hard as well. You know, because many lads get to go back to, and give two or three years with their club after they finish with intercounty. Yeah, and um, that was just taken away as well. So that found that very hard to deal with as well. We had uh, we had Paddy Stapleton on the show last week where he's writing the kids' books and he, he was talking about the first time he picked up the hurl as a moment he distinctly remembers. Like, is that something that 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 you remember quite quite evidently in your head that it was that you're nearly in temporary, I guess, born with a hurl in your hand. You are, yeah, like it's nearly given to you for the first, when you were five or six years of age. I remember my mother, you know, dropped me up to the juvenile club on a Saturday morning and, you know, for the first few, I suppose, months and maybe years, you're kind of like, it's, you know, you don't really want to go up, you'd probably rather be watching a cartoon on television or something, but, you know, eventually, you you know, you get get caught into it and from then on, like from 11 or 12 years of age, it just consumes you, like, uh, we're very lucky with the schools in Turles, you know, it's all hurling. You know, our juvenile club door the slow goal of hurling and then it just brings you on into the into the senior club in Turles. So um yeah, no, we've we've you've no real other choice in Turles really only you know, if you don't play the hurling, you know, you're kind of made you know, you're made play it, you know, that kind of way. So um yeah, no, we've got a great education to be fair up through the years. I there was a great story from the from the book. Um plenty of great stories in the book, but you were talking about the 2009 All Ireland final uh, against Kilkenny and you said in the book, I was at full back, Richie Power was named at full forward for Kilkenny, but Henry Shefflin jogged in at the start. Shit. Looking back, it was a good move by Brian Cody. He probably said to Henry, this lad did well in the league final, but he's the youngest on the tip team, the most inexperienced to go in there and rattle him. Like, absolute, like, thrown in at the deep end as a, as a young hurler, like that's 2009, I don't know what age you were then, but you were young, one of the younger members in the tip panel. Like, that, that must have been quite an experience when you're you're watching Henry Shefflin run towards you at the start of an All-Ireland final. Yeah, you know, like I would have watched him for the previous 10 years, you know, and being in awe of him, like, you know, and being in awe of a lot of little Kenny lads. And, um, you know, it's just to see it, 
you know, I kind of had an inkling that it could happen because I think Brian Cody was starting to move, move around Henry Sheffield maybe in the big days on the more inexperienced players, you know, to try and rattle them maybe in that. And uh, so I had a feeling it could happen. But then between you do your warm up and then you have to pray and the stadium is heaving and bouncing. You know, next thing you turn to your position and you look up and here he's in dragging in, but he's probably wearing number 10 or 12. You're like, oh God, you know, like, but uh, yeah, no, it was, you know, I was scared to start that game as well. Um, I got out in front for the ball, it was only about a minute or two gone and I ran over the ball and it was only him one on one and uh, with Brendan Cummins and he pulled in it. And Brendan Cummins, in fairness to him, got a slight touch and knocked it out. I said, if that went in, like, God knows what way the day would have went for me personally. But, um, but yeah, I know I settled in after that, like, and, uh, but yeah, I know I was lucky enough to come up against some of the, some of the good lads, all right, to be fair. <laughs> Decent, yeah. Were you always a fullback uh, up to that point, or was that a bit of a surprise for you to make the team at fullback at senior? Um, I probably would have played the year or two previous in my club fullback. Right. Um, but necessarily I wasn't really a full-back. You know, Liam Sheedy actually had me full-back in the minor team in 06, but I was always a centre-back, a midfielder, coming up through the, through, up through the years. Um, I even gave a small bit of time in the forwards. but didn't last too long up there now. But, um, but yeah, no, for them first few years, I, I was kind of playing full-back for my club and for Tipperary, and then actually simultaneously I was moved out with my club and moved out with Tipperary as well. So after 09, in 2010 when you stopped the five in a row, you're obviously in the in the half-back line yeah. at that stage. When does that happen? When does that... Uh, sure, it kind of happened. <laughs> it kind of was made happen. I marked... We played Cork in the first round in 2010 and I marked Isaac Helpin below and he kind of destroyed us the same day. He did okay. Yeah, and <laughs> I was moved out to the wing that match and... Right. From then on, it was kind of moved to the wing. I was left to the wing like... And that seemed like your natural position in a way. Yeah, would you believe never played wing back up to that? Right. Never ever played wing back. It was always full back, centre back, midfield. I was never wing back until Liam Shee played me number seven. And just to be honest, which is probably one of, probably my best position down through the years. You know, the one I most felt naturally at. Yeah, isn't that mad? Mm, that yeah. like you know you need to have the traumatic experience of Isaki. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know, and just guess like I got another experience. I was put back in full back in fourteen and. No, I was, I was playing perfectly fine there, but we played Galway in 2014 in the qualifier and, and Johnny Glynn scored two goals off me. Now it, was, I, it wasn't all bad that day, but uh, I was moved out after that as well. And again, it was just, you know, I was moved back in another time as well. So it was, you know, it was, you'd be moved after one or two performances, but then you're put back in again. So Well, I don't think anybody's going to stop by Saki that day. That was like all-time great performance. Yeah, no, it was a uh, tough going because he had given us a bit of a handful in the league game as well that year. So, um you know, he was just so big. He was probably one of the hardest men I've ever marked. Right. Definitely. You talked about the number the number six role in the book as well and how that's changed and even your kind of reference Declan Hannan and, and more recent centre-half backs. But it, that was one of the things that started. You said like to have someone like Brendan Cummins behind you and him shouting at you, you know, watch left or watch left or whatever. And the fact that you can hear him in a crowd of 50, 60, 70,000 people, uh, like, it has changed his position dramatically. But to have a goalkeeper or someone who's so vocal behind you must make it all the, the bit easier. Yeah, you know, I was lucky enough when I was starting out like that. My first few years, 9, 10, 11, we great big personalities and lads with major experience. Brendan Cummins had been in Gove Tipperary for, since the mid-90s. Like, um, you know, Paul Corn was there. Uh, Declan Fannin was there in 2009. Um, Conor Mann, you know, so there was, there was major experience around there. Like, so we were so lucky coming in that these lads had been through it all and they'd been through the tough times as well. So... Um, yeah, I know it was, a bit, it was a big help to us and as I said to you, big personalities made the, made the presence well known on the pitch, like, you know, and even in the dressing room as well. So, um, yeah, we got a good uh, understanding of what was needed and required. Like those those tough times, Caroline Curd is someone we've spoken about plenty on the show mm. from the sports psychology perspective and uh, you talk you touch on it in the book as well, the fact that after that 09 All-Ireland final loss, you're obviously all gutted. I think he's, he's all sat around in a circle and, and shared how you all felt. I suppose this was probably before tw the 2010 season started, but you shared what the 2009 final defeat meant to you personally. And there were a few tears in the room. Yeah, I know it's funny, like, when you actually get a, a group of grown men into a room and they get to talk about their emotions, like, you know, and for the first one or two, you're like, oh, what's, <laughs> what's going on here? But then as it goes around, everyone's actually feeling the same. And it's amazing, like, you know, when everyone actually just talks like that truthfully and honestly, like, what it means to people, like, then you kind of realise this actually means a lot to the group like you know and that's what Karen did she literally just one or two sentences and let the whole thing open up like and that's what she's go very good at like you know and uh, yeah lads just talked about what it, what it felt and what it meant to him to lose and I suppose what it meant to him to win 
possibly win one as well. So, um, yeah, that was kind of, it It really opened up to us all that, geez, this means a lot to lads, you know, and lads with kids, lads that are married, young lads that are already 19, 20 like we were, you know. So, um, you know, it, it all kind of bonded us together and made us feel, you know, that much more of a group and more stronger. And we needed that over certain games that year as well. How important for you was it to, because you're, you're still under 21 in in 2010 when you stopped the five in a row. That's right, you go on and win the... the we won 21 the following Sunday, yeah, yeah. or Saturday, sorry. Yeah. It's not, not a bad week. <laughs> but you had had that experience of being in the team the previous year as a as a 20-year-old or maybe even a 19-year-old at that stage. How important was it for you that the second time you were in the Ireland final was actually the second time and you'd been through that experience of seeing Henry shuffling in? Like, what what was the benefit of that experience? I always stood to us, like, I can only speak for myself, myself I suppose, but it's definitely stood to me like, you know, everything wasn't new, like... The first year it was just you're getting measured up for suits, you're doing this all them small things, tickets, you know, everything was just was a big ordeal, like whether it's the following year, it was just nice and calm, um, you know, everything was new wasn't new, we we knew what to expect. Um like I even remember Liam Sheedy going down to the finest detail of we were training at Simba Stadium one evening and he lined us all up as if we were getting meeting the president <laughs> and do you know, someone came down and met us all. Yeah. I think it was the kit man, half pint. <laughs> and, do you know, even everything was just covered down to tea, like, you know, and we didn't probably have a big, massive peop- amount of people coming in looking as a training. Yeah. You have an official open night like, just before the week of the game, but other than that, it was either a couple of usual local lads just looking in over the, over the, over the gate, like, but, like, we would have obviously heard what went on in Blanc Kenny with I was the, gonna say. the thousands. Yeah. But I think we were just being, were driven just to take, the opportunity knowing that we missed it the year before and um looked yeah we we needed every bit of it like you know to get over them that year you know and when it does happen and the final whistle goes in 2010 and you're an all Ireland champion at senior level like Joe Bradley has spoken before about 93 and winning with Derry and being in the shower afterwards in the cat in the cage pub and drum and almost feel like it was an anti-climax in some in some ways now plenty of other of his Derry teammates felt otherwise but for you what what was that overriding first emotion when you realised that you'd achieved Liam McCarthy yeah I know it was amazing I remember um, he was just running around like a lunatic like basically you just can't believe it and then we received the cup and you're going around meeting supporters afterwards like I remember one of the first supporters I met and actually I wouldn't have really known him at the time was Nick English was a couple of rows back and he just jumped out you know give you a big hug and you're saying, geez, that's Nick English, like, you know, and that's what this is what it means to them. And you're just, everything is just, you're in party mode, like, you know, that night, the following day, the homecoming, everything was just the buzz. And then we had to knuckle back down to Tuesday night and go back training because we were playing the All-Ireland on the 21 on the Saturday. And we were lucky that was played in Turles as well. Um, you know, so, like, I remember the, the lead up into that match, like, and I'm from Turles, so I'm living in town and... And the buzz around the place was just unreal and you knew the boys, the senior boys were going to travel to the county and they were enjoying themselves and we were getting all the pictures but you know we had the opportunity to really make a party of it on the Saturday and everything just went down you know, to a tee like and it was thir- like that week was just amazing like it's it's just real really like and no matter where you went or who you met it was just everyone was in great form and, and buzzing like you know so it's one week I'll never forget anyway and um, the following week I maybe comes in anti climate you're, you're, you're put back into club training and it's lashing rain and you know but no it was an amazing week like and it was one I'll never forget In a way right like we we as a, a fans of hurling become aware of you more that year than even the previous year because you're just breaking into the team but this year like uh, that that team stops the five in a row and so therefore instantaneous everybody is, is on the team is famous and then the next week you back it up in an under 21 game that I think Far more people watched because there were five five seniors on the team, right? Yeah. And uh, like I think the last time that we had heard this happen was '98 in the Galway footballers. I hate to bring it up; it, it kills me. But anyway, um, like it, the, so immediately there's kind of extra weight and celebrity that comes with that. And our identity of you, uh, kind of going back to the start of the conversation, is that you're you're a hurler and you're like a very important member of this team. Um, and I can see how like that just becomes who you are. I'm, I'm now a hurler and we win All-Ireland. So, like, that must have been interesting and a bit of a challenge and also very enjoyable. Like, a kind of whole mix of things. Yeah, you know, I suppose life did change a bit after that 2010 season because I suppose even nationally we came out of, you know, 
you know, we, we came into the limelight, I suppose, and um, there was a lot more eyes on us, and, you know, you could hear the talk of, oh, well, how many are you going to win? <laughs> you know, this kind of thing, and you're like, Jesus, and the effort has gone to that, but, um, you know, definitely we're in the more limelight, you know, if things go well, you get you get all the praise, but likewise, if things were going against you, or it was a loss, you know, or you, we lost the All-Ireland the final year, the criticism was a bit more, you know, straight at you as well, like, you know, so we had to deal with both sides of it, but, um, yeah, like we as we spoke about with the start of the identity, the identity definitely came out that year. You know, the two thousand nine was fine, people kinda of just went, oh you're just so there was not very much about it, but from two thousand ten, the winter two thousand ten onwards, you know, walking down the street you you were known as the hurler really, like, you know, and yeah. um, the the eyes were more or less on you. If that's if if it was Christmas time and you're going out for a pint or and well, you're say, being watched and yeah. you know, people look oh, is he having a yeah, well, <laughs> December, like, yeah. leave, me away, leave me alone, like, you yeah. know, so... Are you tempted to run away from that at all, or do you, do you have to just embrace it? Like, is it is it natural? Um, I suppose it's annoying, and I, when I was younger, probably, I found it annoying. Um, you know, all the eyes were on you, but as I got older and more experienced, you know, I think I kind of dealt, dealt with it and just kind of, you know, it was what it was, it was all part of who we are, and... yeah. Do you know, I'm just as normal as the next person. Like You're kind of at the start of that uh, generation of people who are like, can I get a photograph, can I get a photograph, can I get a photograph, can I get a photograph? Well, like, because I think just starting camera phones around the yeah. time, mm. you, yeah. Um, does that become normal? Is that okay as time goes on? Do you just get good at that and understand that that's what it's going to be like tonight where and uh, there's going to be some melts around? Yeah, you know, I suppose um, earlier on, the first year, I think even referenced the book that you know, people look for uh, for photos after they all learned when we were beaten, and I'm like, what are you looking for a photo of me for? Like, yeah. I'm only here a year, like. Um, but as time went on, yeah, you do find it, and the camera phones then, you know, were more, you know, you find, you, know, you could be inside in a bar, or you could be anywhere in some matter, uh, a child, or someone could come up and go, can we get it, and just pull the phone out in front of you and start yeah. taking pictures, and you're looking, do you know, like, so, um, but you do get used to it, like, I suppose, and as I said, that's the, that's the way it is now, you know, everyday life, you know, no matter who you are. So, um, but yeah, no, it was, it's, again, at the start, I probably found it a nine, but again, you you grow to get used to it. That uh, that being thrust into the limelight as well, I guess pundits take notice of the, of the team and the, the new players coming through. There was a great uh, paragraph you had in one of the chapters as well. You said, I, I can remember Gerlach Nan saying back around 2009 that the Tipperary defence was very slow, that if you turned us, we'd be in trouble, which is an narrative I'd heard a few times over the years, that if a team got us running back towards our own goal, we were essentially screwed. Like that, that was that something that punditry and lazy narratives became a thing around 2009, 2010, That you were like, okay, teams are after us now because we're we're starting to win games. Yeah, look, I, I just I just felt it was a bit yeah, as you said, they're a bit lazy. Like to throw that as like people would have said that throughout all my whole career. And like would have said it about various players if I was on the Tipperary team. Like, but you know, I don't ever think we were like ever looked we were ever slow or anything like that. And as I said in the book, like if if you run at any defence, if it's hurling, if it's football, and you break through, like every defender is going to look slow, like turning and chasing back, <laughs> yeah. like you know. So, I just felt that was that, that didn't really hold up, really, to be honest with you. And um, I don't think anything like that ever caught us out over the years, like you know. So, um, but yeah, again, that is all part and parcel of you know as you're getting a bit more successful and winning a bit more, a few more games, that the line is going to be on you a bit more, as we spoke about whether it's supporters you know, at home or whatever, or even as, if it's if it's pundits or, you know, the Sunday game, different things like that, like, you know, so, um, again, it's all part and parcel. It probably would have been something, again, that would have, would, have, would have frustrated me to start, but as I got older and got more experienced, it was something just went over my head. It's easy to enjoy those All-Irelands at the time, like, but, like, Gavin White was in with us on a Saturday there recently, and he, the morning after, picking up his first All-Star with Kerry, like, you have six of them. Like, is it is it at the point where... Now that you're retired, you can kind of look back and say, "Jesus, that's not the, bad." The individual honours are fairly, fairly nice to look back on now because at the time you can't really talk too much about the individual honours. It's all about the team, but now you can kind of look back and say, "Jesus, I was fairly good." Yeah, I suppose again, it was wasn't. I didn't really reflect on anything in my career until actually writing the book, with, doing the book with with, uh, with Michael Minahan, and you're kind of obviously he's making you delve into everything that went on, whether it was the good games, the bad games you know, the wins, the losses, whatever it was. And, yeah, look, it is nice to look back and, and, and like, 
I know GA players, especially obviously they're all going to be still playing and involved. They're going to say, look, it's still about the team, usual stuff. But there's no doubt about it. It's nice winning an award, an individual award, such as, as prestigious as an all star. And um, I suppose now I can look back and say, yeah, look, it's proud to have them. And my mother is my home, probably looking after him. You know, and Rowan is lucky enough to have a couple there as well. So I was going to say, how many does he have? Yeah, I think he's two. I think. All right, he's got a while, a while to go. Catch up yet? Yeah, but um, <laughs> hopefully he does. That means we're going well at home. So. Um, <laughs> But yeah, no, they are nice to have, to be honest with you. And it probably, now for me, I can look back and say, yeah, it just shows that I put in a lot of hard work and it took a lot of hard um, you know, effort and, I suppose, sacrifice. And um, yeah, look, it is nice to look back and have them a couple of awards and I appreciate there wasn't another all or two with it now to be nice. You'd have been uh, marking on Kelly sometimes in training. You might be marking him on the sideline this year. He's, uh, he's in yeah. with Davey. That's going to be interesting. Yeah, you know, he's down with Davy and Warford, you know, so it'll be interesting times this year. Right? Nice um, low profile Munster Championship this season. <laughs> Jesus, yeah. Um, but yeah, no, I think there were there's probably a connection there from LIT over the years. I think the two of them were, were involved together in the Skipping Cup. But yeah, I know it'll be interesting. Um, we don't, but it was in our, in our home club at Turles there a few years ago, he gave a handout. So um, yeah, I know he's going to bring a lot of expertise down to, to Davy now as well. So um, but yeah, no, it'll be interesting times ahead next summer. Yeah, and um, Limerick obviously going up for their own little bit of history. It's uh, nice to have many teams desperate to stop them. Yeah, that's the thing. Like, who's who's going to who's going to stop them? Like, and if they can be stopped at all. But look, fantastic, fantastic team, and they're going through the time now. Probably that Kilkenny went through um, during the thousands. You know, just that kind of unbeatable feeling, like you know, and yeah. No one's going to stop us, and and they're, and they're probably and they're hungry for more. Like you know, they don't sound like the personalities that are going to be happy with what they have. Like and you know, it's going to take an awful effort from someone. It's going to take an unbelievable performance on one given day, and for to knock to kill, get Limerick off their perch. And is the Patrick's Well game? Is there any context that that's important in terms of what happens next year? Does it matter at all? Is it just a completely separate competition, totally irrelevant? Which game is that? I'm sorry. The um the Munster Club. Does that matter? Oh, sorry. Uh, Napierstig. Napierstig. Sorry. Um, does that matter in terms of an All Ireland? Is there anything that like Ballygunner can do? Any template that they can put up against those lads, or is it actually better for the rest of the country if they go on and win a club All Ireland and um, over celebrate a bit? <laughs> um, I don't think them kind of lads now. To be honest. Um, no, I wouldn't think it's any bearing. Like I think Ballygunner have their own way of playing, and they're so. You can see down through. The, I think Bally going to have a run through through every club team they have. They all play in the same way, so they're not going to change their identity for. I don't think the Pierschix, the way the Pierschix going to play. So that's why I think that game is going to be so intriguing. Um, who wins out in that? Um, you know, I'm I'm working down the beside in around in the Pierschix lads in Car Devon down there. So spying. Yeah, I think they're really going to push for. They're going. They're going for big time this year. I think you know. So that's going to be a cracking game. You know, I'm going to try and get into it if I can and. Uh, <laughs> Which I'm really looking forward to. That. That'd be a cracker. Like, and it would be interesting if Bally Gunner's style of play can, you know, upset the Napierstig lads and see, you know, as you said there, it could be something for a result to look at maybe in a couple of months' time. Any any little bit of evidence helps. Well, listen, we wish you the very best for the. And was the therapy therapeutic in the end? Do, do you feel better for having written it, or is it like, oh, geez? Yeah, it probably was just something I never thought of doing, and probably was never going to. You know, if you asked me a few years ago, I was like, no, I'm not, no way. And then. When I was put to him, I was like, yeah, do you know what? And, it's, and Michael was brilliant with me as well, like, you know, and, uh, you know, we had we some great chats. And, yeah, to be honest with you, when I finished it then, he said, that's it, we're done now. And you sign off and you said you're happy with everything. And you said, do you know what? I actually enjoyed that. And, you know, it made me reflect on games and, you know, obviously games that didn't go so well, like the couple of irons we talked about or, you know, the games that did go well, like 2010 that week and, you know, 2019, 16, whatever it was. And... You know, I just said, John, that, that was actually nice, and you kind of go, you kind of, you know, breathe out and go, that's it, like, and you can try and move on if you can, like, you know. So, um, no, I really enjoyed it. I remember sitting, we had a, a live hurling show uh, for off the ball in Croker, the Limerick Cork All Ireland semi final in 2018. I remember sitting beside you yourself, between yourself and Dan Shanahan, which was just the most remarkable insight for a game of that magnitude. But, do, like, you were sitting there and uh, talking about the game as a player. Like, will you now watch? hurling in a completely different way as a, as someone involved in either punditry or coaching like can you can you almost relax now when you're when you're not involved in the game directly as a player can you now just kind of almost see it differently yeah look i suppose the Tipperary games last year i was watching my brother was involved in and obviously i'm after leaving so i was still kind of look you know 
doing everything I could to try and nudge him over the line. But all the other games then I enjoyed, I really enjoyed, I never went to so many hurling games in my life and even to games that at junior intermediate level at home, the club that I would never went to. But yeah, you, you are kind of going looking at what way are they setting up and, and what are they, what way are doing to counteract them and different things like that. So you're probably looking at it in a different in a different way more than just turning on a game and just watching to see what happens like, you know. So, um, yeah, I know the mindset probably has changed a small bit, you know, and then, you know, I'm getting involved now in the backroom team with Tipperary and stuff, so you are watching how other teams are, what other way players are playing, or is there anything you can pick up maybe? You know, it's even gone so mad that you want you watch a football game, so you can pick up something off the football game that <laughs> you might be able to bring into the hurling side of things. So, yeah, I know the mind has been overdrive a bit, but at least in a diff- it's in a different way more than when you were a player. Well, listen, we wish you the very best of luck with it. The book uh, is available in all bookshops now, but if you want to get a signed copy, you can head along to Easton's in Clonmel at 10 o'clock on Saturday morning and then at Thurless in Easton's at 12 o'clock. It's called All on the Line, A Memoir of Hurling and Commitment. Paul, thanks very much for joining us. Cheers, Leslie.